Tonight, space has a new horizon, then Scott Johnson drops by to explain life as the weird kid. Padres Corner is next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Padres Corner is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Padres Corner is brought to you by IT Pro TV. Are you looking to upgrade your IT skills or prepare for certification? IT Pro TV offers engaging and informative tutorials streamed to your Roku computer or mobile device. For a free seven day trial and 30% off the lifetime of your account, go to itpro.tv slash PC and use the code PC30. This is Padres Corner, episode 25. Recorded February 7th, 2015, for February 17th, 2015. Scott Johnson. Welcome to Padres Corner. It's the Twitch show where we put you into the mind of a Jesuit priest and see if you come out sane on the other side. I'm Father Robert Palliser, the digital Jesuit Padre SJ in the Twit TV chat room. A, a while back, we uh, decided that we wanted a show that would cover the topics that fall through the cracks. Things that don't really make the news but are big enough that our geeks and our gals might want to talk about them. That's what Padre's Corner is all about. And as always, we're going to start ourselves with some freaking engineering. Now, did you know that late last year, space changed forever? That's right. We just didn't really hear about it. You see, New Horizons woke from hibernation on December 6, 2014, and it began its mission to study the dwarf planet Pluto. Now, uh, imagine this. Here's a probe that was launched almost a decade ago. It's traveled 3 billion miles. It's 4 hours and 25 light minutes from Earth. It was launched before Pluto was demoted from planet status. In other words, they launched this thing when they thought they were going to be surveying a planet, and now it's a dwarf planet. On the way, it snapped pictures of Jupiter and the Jovian moons, and it has now started transmitting images back to Earth of Pluto. By May... Because of the bandwidth restrictions, those images should surpass the resolution of what we're getting from Hubble Space Telescope. All this means is that we're going to get a clearer view of the edge of our solar system than we ever have before. This is an amazing time to be interested in science. But strangely enough, this most noble of probes spent most of its life Sleeping. sleeping. You see, New Horizons was activated for just two months out of each year to check and calibrate the systems, but then it spent the rest of the year in deep hibernation with nothing more than a beacon to tell NASA that everything is okay. We just ping back every once in a while and say systems are good, systems are good, systems are good. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, why wouldn't you keep the probe on if it's going to be passing by such interesting features of space? And the honest answer is, aside from Jupiter... It really didn't encounter a whole lot. Space is really empty, especially once you get way, way out there. And they decided instead to save the probe for when it got to its target on the orbit of Pluto. Now, there is another problem. That problem is that power, as you get further and further away from the sun, is harder to come by. Spacecraft within the orbits of Mars and Earth can typically be powered by solar power. But once you get further out, solar power just isn't going to cut it. You can't generate enough with the solar panels that you would be able to carry on a probe of that size. And so they turn to nuclear. Specifically, they turn to RTGs. Those are radioisotope thermoelectric generators. Quite simply, it's radiation in a box, a box that creates electrical energy. Now, RTGs, this one in, in particular, was a holdover from the Cassini missions. It was going to be a spare that they repurposed for New Horizons. It's 24 pounds of plutonium-238 oxide inside a container filled with the fuel formed into pellets that are clad in iridium and then encased in a graphite shell. RTGs work on the Peltier effect, and actually we, we covered the Peltier effect on Know How, a show here on Twit TV, where we showed people that by using a thermocouple, you could induce an electrical charge with a temperature differential, and that's exactly how RTGs work. As long as you have a hot side and a cool side, you can get electrical power. Well, in the case of an RTG that's going to be on a spacecraft, the hot side is going to be the plutonium-238, which will glow bright hot on its own accord. And the cold side is going to be the deep confines of space. Now, this particular RTG provided 250 watts of power at 30 volts 
at the time of launch. That dropped off at the rate of 5% for every four years of operation, which means that since the probe has been operating for almost 10 years, it's dropped about 12 or so percent, now providing something north of 220 watts of power. But here's the thing. They didn't actually save power by putting New Horizon into hibernation mode because an RTG generates heat all the time. You can't shut it off. It's not a reactor with control rods. It just does it because of radioactive decay. That means that that decay was going to happen whether or not they were extracting the power from it. No, the reason why they shut it off is because they wanted to save wear and tear on the spacecraft. They wanted to save it so that the components would last when they finally got into the orbit of Pluto. That's right, New Horizon was in hibernation because they needed the resources back on Earth more than they needed the resources on the spacecraft. Because as a spacecraft is in orbit, as it is in active uh, journey towards its, its mission target, you're going to need a support team on Earth, and they didn't want to have to do that. Now, 220 watts is not actually enough to operate all the instruments on the New Horizon, so NASA has had to be very selective about which instruments are on at which time. And it's amazing the kind of science that they're going to be able to get. Everything from magnetic detectors to high-resolution cameras to a molecular sampler that will be able to breathe some of the high-altitude winds coming off of the dwarf planet Pluto. Now, the technology is baffling. The mission is absolutely fantastic. But if you're a space geek, New Horizon is the New Horizon. Now, when we come back, we're going to be speaking with Scott Johnson. He's a, a podcaster, a, a, just a personal idol of mine, someone who has taken his passion and turned it into something fantastic. But before we get there, I want to take a chance to talk about the first sponsor of this episode of Padres Corner, and that's IT Pro TV. Now, IT Pro TV is a video network dedicated exclusively to the world of information technology. Whether you're looking to jump, start a career in IT, or are already working in the field, IT Pro TV supplements traditional learning methods in a fun and engaging way that maximizes your learning and prepares you for certification. IT Pro TV offers you hundreds of hours of content, with 30 hours being added each week. This library includes video courses on Microsoft, Cisco, Apple, A+, CCNA, Security+, MCSA, CISSP, PowerShell, and Linux+, Plus, covering topics like network security, Linux, Windows, OS 10 support for desktops, servers, and more. But IT doesn't have to be boring. IT Pro TV hosts tell engaging stories and share personal stories that bring you in and increases your data retention. Our shows are streamed live and are available on demand worldwide to your Roku, to your computer, and your mobile device. Chromecast, too. And you can interact with the host during the show and share topic-specific web-based Q&As. If this sounds familiar, it's because the folks over at IT Pro TV are huge fans of Twit. They have over 10 years of experience in IT learning, and they were inspired by Leo. So they use the same studio setup that we have, the same TriCast or the same cameras. Now, even if you're already studying with a book or enrolled in a certification or technical degree program, this is a fantastic supplement to learn at your own pace and track your progress. They include, me, include measure up practice exams so you can figure out exactly where you are in your learning process. And my personal favorite part, they have a virtual machine sandbox. It's a lab environment so that you can use those millions of dollars worth of equipment without actually having to shell out for millions of dollars worth of equipment. You get this all for one low monthly price, which includes daily updates and new features monthly. It's comparable to the cost of a study guide, and it's much cheaper than going to an IT boot camp. So here's what we want you to do. We want you to upgrade your brain with the most popular IT certifications recognized by employers today. Go to itpro.tv PC. You're going to get a free seven-day trial when you sign up using our offer code PC30, which will allow you to check out their courses, their live stream, and more. Subscriptions are normally $57 per month, $570 for the entire year, but we have a special offer because they're huge fans of Twit. If you sign up now and use the code PC30, you'll receive 30% off your subscription for the lifetime of your account. That's less than $40 per month or $399 for the entire year. And once you reach your 13th month, they will reduce your subscription rate even further, bringing your costs down to $24.95 per month or $249 for the entire year. That's itpro.tv slash PC, itpro.tv slash PC, and use the code PC30 to try it free for seven days and save 30% off. And we thank ITPRO TV for their support of Padres Corner. 
Now let's go to my favorite part of the show. It's when we bring in a geek, a guest, someone who I just want to talk to. And uh, folks, this person is someone who I've admired, someone whose work I've very much enjoyed, someone who I think everyone in geekdom owes a debt of gratitude. It's Mr. Scott Johnson. Scott, thank you very much for coming on the Padres Corner. Oh my gosh, that is the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me and totally unfounded, but I totally appreciate it. That's very nice. You've, you've flattered me, sir. That's absolutely found it. Now, uh, you're not just a personality on the internet. You're not just a person who runs one of the coolest cons that I know of. You're not just a person who is a good father and a real geek, but you're a man with some serious art talent, sir. Uh, for, for the folks at home, if you were to describe yourself in two or less sentences, what would you want them to remember you by? Two or less. Holy crap. That's um, one. Oh, I'm already out. Oh, there's two. <laughs> Uh, my first one would be, I would like to be judged on how my kids turned out. And that may seem like the easy cheesy answer, the easy cheesy, but that is, that is really number one for me. And so far, so good. They all are pretty awesome kids, all three of them. And I'm really happy with how they're turning out. So, so fingers crossed, we'll see how they do at the end of this all, but, uh, so far, so good. Secondly, it would be that, uh, oh, I guess the second sentence is, uh, did he at least try really hard to follow his dreams in his career? And I can say, at least again so far, that I've done that. Uh, and I hope that those are two the two big crowners. Because I'm never going to play professional baseball. And I'm never going to be, you know, I don't know, on Discovery Channel. Or whatever other thing I might have as a, as a dream of mine. But... Those two things, I feel pretty confident that we're sort of on our way with those. I, I, I want to back up on that because you you said something that I think strikes a tone with a lot of the folk who are watching this show right now. And that is this idea of, did I follow my passion? Did I follow my dream? Did, did I do my level-headed best to make a career out of the thing that I consider the thing I love, my hobby, my whatever it is that drives me forward? Now, of course, for you, parenthood, being a father, being a husband, that's that's all big parts of it. But you do have a, a huge geek background that has played into your work, into the work in developing your own network and your own brand. Let's back up a little bit. W where did you come from? <laughs> well, if you really want to dig far enough back, you basically find the same thing, just a little bit more immature. Uh, essentially, when I was a little kid and through my young years and my teens, I spent a lot of time uh, with a tape recorder making fake little radio shows for myself and my friends. And I spent a lot of time with a sketchbook drawing all the time. And those are essentially the two things I'm still doing now. What's weird is it really hasn't changed all that much from then. Uh, the content's better, more people are interested. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it's basically the fulfillment of of that kid's dreams. And when you and I have spoke before, I think I may have mentioned this idea of if I could go back in time and tell him that, um, hey, one day you're going to get to do this stuff and you're going to not only not only going to get to do it all the time, but you're going to get to do it as a full time job where you're the boss. Uh, I don't think he would believe me. I think he would run away and scream and try to find his parents and say a strange man is talking to me or something, because I don't think he'd have any real idea that that was even possible. And I had no idea it would truly be possible until, you know, the late 90s when things started to look real interesting on the internet and that very quickly started to evolve into the early aughts. And when I jumped in, you know, full time with this stuff later in 2009, uh, you know, so much has changed so quickly that it almost came and went before I even noticed it happening. But in the end, if I look back, it's, it's, the, it's the coming true of that thing this kid hoped would happen one day where all of those barriers were gone. I didn't have to go through an agent. I didn't have to work with editors. I didn't have to deal with the fact that if you wanted to get on the radio, for example, it was a very hard thing to do and it was all FCC regulated and you had to have crappy jobs at, at uh, stations and work your way up. And even if you did, it's very cutthroat, kind of an ugly place to be, at least by a lot of accounts and very difficult to get your head in there. Same goes for comics and comic work in general, very hard to get that stuff done with all the middlemen that used to exist. And they just suddenly fell away. So all of this just sort of landed and you went, oh, well, I, now I can do all of this without having to deal with any of that. And um, I guess the rest is history. And I'm certainly not the only one. There's so many of us now putting out such cool, created, user-created stuff that, that would have never made the light of day 20 years ago. 
And uh, it feels good to be in a place where that's, you know, happening more and more. And, and you know, in, in a lot of ways to have been early in the in the early aughts with with early shows and early efforts at web comics. I started that in 2001. And this feeling that that stuff is, you know, now kind of anybody can do it now is really great. And I and I wish I could go back in time and, and just assure that kid that he didn't have to worry about it, that one day this stuff will make sense and you'll get to do it. Uh, I think he would have gotten a real kick out of it. You know, two things about that. First, I think you just described what should happen in every time traveling movie ever when someone finds their younger self, which is the younger self would run off saying, I need an adult. Uh, I, I think that's far more likely than being able to tell him the secrets of the universe. The second thing is, and, and this, this really does strike a chord within me, it sounds as if, and I say this with, with all adm admiration, that you were a weird kid. Oh, and totally. I kid. think I, I was also a weird kid. Mm. And I, I think you're absolutely right. I think if someone went back and told me that, hey, you know what, being a weird kid is going to pay off in the future, I I wouldn't believe it. it yeah, it, right. Being being a weird kid is definitely a thing I have. I can I can relate to. And being weird in ways that um, was always difficult to explain. And honestly, it's difficult to explain now. Half my family, my immediate family, have no idea what the crap I'm doing. My wife and kids do, but anybody beyond that, my mom still can't explain it to her friends. Uh, most of my in-laws kind of scratch their head and they're not sure what Scott does for a living. And um, it's unfortunate because it would be a lot more fun to talk to them about this business if they sort of understood it. Um, but being not only a weird kid, but a really tall, gangly weird kid meant two things. It seemed like the taller I got, my nerdy tendencies toward, you know, Dungeons and Dragons and cartoons and just stuff that I was into, weird comic books and stuff, it became less and less of a, I became less and less of a target by bullies because I started getting really tall. And it's weird to say this, but the taller I got, the less I had to deal with that. And they kind of left me alone. And I think I just, I looked like a kid who could maybe defend himself, even though I probably couldn't have, and I didn't feel very tall. But you know, six foot four at the, tail, to, at the tail end of junior high means that you are a pretty big, formidable looking dude. And that really helped me because it left me to my devices. It let me read as many comics as I wanted. Uh, let me put the kind of people around me that I wanted to have around me. And many of them were weird and, and total nerds or whatever. And, and we would find our place without the constant fear of some, you know, at the time jock or whatever, wanting to, wanting to take us down a few pegs. And so I think that was a huge boon to me. And I often wonder, because at the time I wasn't really noticing it. I look back now and I wonder what were the shorter, slight kids? How did they deal with this? Like, how did they deal with that kind of pressure from different cliques and stuff to not be the weird kids that they were meant to be. And uh, I feel really bad about that. I feel like I got a real lucky uh, draw on the height thing, uh, even though it annoyed me in some ways and it made me just this big, skinny, weird looking kid. It kept me out of that kind of trouble and honestly led me to, to feel like, well, I could be just about any kind of nerd I want to be. And those other kids may not care, but they're leaving me alone. And that's, and that's good enough. Uh, so yeah, growing up as a weird kid has been good, but also being a bit of a weird adult is also good because it has this side effect of my children. Essentially, they don't want, they don't have any feelings of like my dad's an old fuddy duddy fart who doesn't know what he's doing or saying, or he doesn't understand me, or he doesn't get all this technology that surrounds us today or any of that. They can't say those things because none of it's true. I had, you know, I had, uh, <laughs> Pinterest accounts before my wife had one. I had Facebook accounts before anybody. I've got, I had a Snapchat account before my kids even knew what Snapchat was. Staying on the cusp of those things and kind of keeping up with where social media was headed and how it affected my work and how I could connect to it to, to increase viewership and that kind of thing um, has really paid off. But in, 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 in the best way it's paid off is my kids don't think I'm some lame dad. Um, they kind of think what I do is really cool. And I have kind of a major advantage that way uh, versus parents who, you know, maybe feel like they're a little bit out of touch with what's going on with kids today. So, so it has this nice double-edged swordness to it. And being that weird kid has got me in a place now where it is actually cool for these kids to be into Marvel and to be into DC or to be into Lord of the Rings or whatever it is now. It's so mainstream now. They don't have the same pressure to avoid that stuff that we did as kids. So in a way, everything has made it easier for me to be that weird old dad in a time where now this stuff's more acceptable, if any of that makes sense. But I definitely feel that way. I think it's absolutely makes sense. It's absolutely acceptable for us because 
that's what most of us. I mean, if if you're really involved with with Twit or with any podcast network or with tech in general, you probably had a little bit of the weird kid in you, and you probably had a little bit of the nonconformist in you, and you probably have that yearning to follow your passion, like so many people who I admire on the internet have done. I, I, I want to talk a little bit about about that specifically because. Your talents lent themselves into art, specifically into the art that I just I find fantastic. You've you've got a wonderful sense for for the absurd, and you've also got a wonderful sense of of where pop culture is, and mm. you've got the art skills to back it up. That's that's one of those things that I think many people who want to get into this this gig don't get, which is yes, it's good to be in the right place at the right time. Yes, it's good to have passion, but at some point you have to develop those talents to the to the point at which they become marketable to other people. How did you come by your skills as an artist and as a broadcaster? Well, I had a teacher um, in high school. He's actually a college professor, but we had met him in high school when I was visiting there for one of those summer camps. And it was like an art camp in the summer. This is my sophomore year. And I remember being there and him saying something I've never forgotten, which was, if you guys all want to be artists one day, I have a simple way to do it. All you have to do is to do what I tell you to do and you'll you'll find success as an artist, whatever kind of artist you want to be. You want to be illustrators, cartoonists, commercial artists, designers, whatever it is you're trying to do, I have the way to do it. And, and we all sat and wrapped attention wondering what this great secret was. And he said, carry a sketchbook with you and draw at least an hour a day. If you have to break it up into 15 minute increments, if you have to do half now and half later, or just sit down for an hour and 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 if you can do more, great. But draw for an hour a day minimum, and you will become the thing you want to become. You'll be able to draw the way you want to draw. And he was right. Um, I took that to heart. I did that. Uh, there are many artists who I admire who are far better than me, who spent less time drawing when they were growing up, and there are artists who maybe aren't as good as me who spent more time, but. The averages work out to be if you practice and work at it, the 10,000 rule applies here. You, you'll you improve, you'll get better. Um, the, the real hard thing, though, that some people are surprised by, at least, I don't know, some people I talk to are surprised by, the hard bit is finding your own voice. Finding your own style, that's something you can work on and you can, you can mechanically get to a place where you have your own style. I don't care who you are, what kind of medium you're in, you'll find it if you keep at it. So that's just sort of math. The hard part is finding your voice. And that voice is so important. And you've and so here's this is going to fly in the face of kind of what you just said. Having the art skills to back it up is great and all, but a really important voice sometimes trumps all of that. So if you look at something like XKCD, which is stick people, uh, that is an absolutely brilliant comic in every sense of the word. And as it stands, the sense of humor and the writing that comes to that comic just so happens to also fit really well with the sort of purposeful stick figure, simple art that it includes. Uh, and what they do there is smash all previous held ideas that art is everything when it comes to comics. It's not. In fact, it may be the least important thing, or at the very least, it is only half of the equation. The big part of the equation is finding your own voice, having that voice connect with other people and have that be meaningful in some way. And XKCD has done that in a major serious way when it comes to web culture. Others include, you know, Madden with uh, the oatmeal. The oatmeal is a freaking, uh, you know, unstoppable machine. And a huge part of that is because he has got an incredible writing talent, uh, puts humor with, with, with truth in a way that nobody else seems to be doing. He brings to it a cool art style, but one that isn't all that incredible. In fact, you look at it and go, well, yeah, I can, I can name 100 cartoonists. This is not to knock him at all, but 100 cartoonists that maybe are better artists, maybe more technical than he is. But his voice and his writing matched with his style is, you know, greater than the sum of its parts. And that's the hard thing. That's the thing I still struggle all the time to try to achieve is find a way to get the voice and the art to sing better than they would individually. And that's challenging. And sometimes I hit it and sometimes I don't. Sometimes I don't think I did. And I look at it a year later and I go, oh, that was all right. That wasn't as bad as I thought it was. That's pretty funny, in fact. Let's put that in the book or whatever. And, you know, sometimes I think something's terrible and then George Takei will go retweet something I drew and, and have me question myself. Well, maybe it's bad. Maybe the stuff I think is bad is actually good. This sounds like chaos maybe to those who don't understand this, but it is actually part of the battle. It's part of the journey. And you never quite get completely comfortable with your quote unquote voice. The challenge isn't 
achieving it. The challenge is finding it and you're always finding it. And even the best of us will keep trying to find it. It sounds, there should be some music behind me now because it sounds so inspirational, but <laughs> the truth, the truth, the truth of it is, as it all adds up, that is the constant battle. Find your voice. If it's in humor, find what's funny, find what comes out uh, of you uniquely. Don't just regurgitate what you hear. Uh, let the things around you inspire you, that kind of thing. Uh, and if the art is there also, as long as it matches with, again, your voice, then you've got something special. I really, I'm super proud of the body of my work, but I also look at it and go, you know, there's so many, there's so many things I could go and do to improve it. So that's important to me. As much as what, is, what it's achieved, I'm much more interested in seeing where it goes still. You know, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned XKCD because when I first saw your work, the, the two artists who I thought reminded me a little bit of your work were, were XKCD because of the biting commentary. I love biting commentary, especially when it's not crass, but it's just very intelligent. It's got a, it's got a lot of different layers, a lot, a lot of different levels that you can understand. Sure. And the other artist was Bill Watterson. It reminded, it really did remind me of my Calvin and Hobbes, Hobbes day. There was the, that that kind of artwork was semi surreal, semi. This is the mind of a particular person, and I, I think that's what drew me into your work. And the, the the fun part is that I see a lot of the same attention to detail, not just in your artwork, but in your broadcasting. Could, could mm. we talk a little bit about the Frog Pants Network because uh, it it's a it's a very interesting idea. We, we do it here at Twit as well, but you've you've gathered together people who have like minds, who have other passions, and you've given them a form. You've given them a voice. Could could you talk to me about talk to me about why you started Frog Pants Studios? Well, um, it, it does again. It goes kind of back to my love of radio and talk radio and how much I loved that growing up. And um, I always wanted to do something in it. I didn't know what or how. And and now that it's here, it's it's the funnest thing in the world. But. Uh, what I found is I have a decent, uh, it's not 100% all the time, but I have a pretty good feel for people and how they'll be with me and how, how I'll be with them and kind of getting a good, I can get a good spin on somebody's personality almost by just meeting them barely, shaking a hand and having a couple of words is usually enough for me to kind of know where I'm headed with somebody. And that served me really well on the podcasting side of things. So I tend to gravitate kind of naturally without really even trying toward people who who fit well in that uh, in that arena? People like Tom Merritt, Veronica Belmont, uh, Brian Dunaway, Brian Ibbett. Uh, the list goes on. My co-hosts on the instance, like all of these different co-hosts I have, and people I collaborate with, kind of came out of nowhere. And maybe they're the same because we all end up listening to each other's things before we knew each other. Uh, there would be some exchange via email or something, and before you know it, there's more conversations. There's hey, we should do something together, and, and by the end of it all, there is something we're doing together. And in some cases. We're collaborating constantly, um, you know, lending each other our voices, lending each other our ideas, collaborating on shows with each other and separately. And that has been such a cool thing for me. It's something I never expected from any of this. I always wondered if it would just be, you know, me in a in a basement for the rest of my life talking to myself and and not sure I'd be, you know, working with other people in this way. But it has turned out to be exactly the opposite. And you that ability to sort of attract each other into the stuff that we're doing has been has been huge for me. So from its humble beginnings as just me saying, hey, I should do a show about this thing to uh, to what it is now, which is a big collaborative effort where we all, you know, are, are at different meetups and events. We're going to do Nerdtacular again this year, which is going to be awesome. I can't wait to see everybody again. Um, all of that stuff's really important, but maybe the most important co-host, and this is going to sound cheesy, and I promise you it's not meant to be, because I really genuinely mean this, but the it's the third chair, which is the audience. That's the thing I really didn't understand or know about when I got started and how important it is now. And I don't just mean a live chat room or the people who listen to it uh, casually at home or whatever. It's these really active, interested parties who are taking an active role in helping build this community into something more than just a static listening audience. And it's a very difficult thing to define to people who don't understand it. But once you kind of get a vision of what's possible with this kind of interaction that didn't exist 20 years, 30 years ago, when it was just dude on the radio, thousands heard it, everyone goes home. This is more like a collaborative effort between me and them and them and us and then me with my co-hosts and back and forth. That's a special thing. And it's almost starting to sound like, well, duh, in this age that we're in now, because, you know, enough years have passed where people have been doing this kind of work 
that we've seen communities crop up. We understand how they're born. We understand it now. But it still kind of blows my mind the uh, the kind of relationships you can forge and the kind of uh, the kind of experiences you can have when you build a strong community. So, so yeah, that's been a that's been a crucial part of this as it's grown. When I started, though, it was just all about I want to do a radio show, and that was a that was really my motivation. Um, you know, now it has a lot of facets, and one of them is to keep growing. You know, growing the people around it. Uh, Scott, you, you mentioned Nerdtacular, and I, I want to talk about that in a little bit, but uh, first. There was a question that came from the chat room, and um, I find it very interesting, about in the radio world, there is a hierarchy, and there's a pecking order, and there's a way that you you earn your dues, and you, you come mm -hmm. up slowly through the ranks, and then eventually you get what it is that you want. The internet, and a lot of the technologies that have developed around podcasting or netcasting, have kind of turned that on their heads. And you, you've got people who are incredibly popular, who have huge audiences, that didn't have to go through that old world pecking order. Um, and it's it's strange. Uh, and specifically the question in the chat room was, do you ever feel as if you quote unquote cheated because <laughs> you found all this this fame, you found this success without having to spend, you know, 20 years as someone's coffee person and so on and so forth. Uh, 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 let me give you an example. Just, just a while back, I was in Chicago. I was on a panel about broadcasting and mm. uh, it was, there was, me and there was two, two other Jesuits and then a bunch of broadcasters from the Chicago area. And one of the questions was specifically to me because I was the only one on the panel without a journalism degree. I was the only one on the panel who had not served as an intern somewhere at a radio t station or a TV station. And they specifically asked that question. They said, don't you feel bad for taking audience away from these people who have earned it? And hmm. I, I, I didn't know what to say. I, I was like, well, you know, this is this is the new world. This is the Internet. It's earning it is a matter of are you passionate? Does the passion come through? Do, does it resonate with people? And ultimately, will they watch you? Well, you still earn it, though. See, I think that's there's 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 a there's a there's something about that assumption that is actually kind of chronically wrong. Uh, and, and I'll give you an example here. Would it would it be fair for me to begrudge, say, a popular stand up comedian, which is this is happening all the time now? Uh, that starts a podcast and immediately has an audience of 300,000 people because they carried them over from their real world stand up world. Uh, no, I shouldn't begrudge them that. I mean, sometimes I get irritated when they all claim they invented podcasting, but that's a that's a perceptual thing. My my problem, uh, my I have no problem with that because in in their own way they kind of have earned it also. But I am kind of known. I mean, I've been at this 10 years, dude. 10th year of podcasting, actually a little more than that. Yeah, a little bit more than 10 years of podcasting now, uh, calling them podcasts. And I did a bunch of stuff pre-2004 before podcasting was a thing that was just MP3s on a website. I'm not even counting that in 03 and 02. Um, I've been at this for a long time. And I am kind of the tortoise in the tortoise and hare race here. It is slow and steady wins the race. You know, does it does it help that somebody like, let's say Leo, somebody like Leo has got this long storied career in, in broadcasting and radio and also on tech TV and all this stuff. Did that help him launch Twit and get where, where Twit is today? Absolutely it did. Should anyone begrudge him that? No, they absolutely should not. He still earned it. He earned it in different venues and different places and it carried over. Some of us like me are starting, starting here. This is where it began is on the internet. I didn't like it wasn't like I came to this with a bunch of extra baggage um, but that stuff just builds up over time um, you know so I could I could say well it's taken me 10 years only took that other guy a year because he already had you know he was on TV once and now he's got this huge thing or whatever I don't think any of that kind of stuff is fair to anybody in the in the room I mean they're all earning it in their own way um, if you brought somebody in off the street well let's look at somebody like Justin Bieber everybody wants to complain that this this kid's spoiled rotten and all this stuff, and he drives me kind of bonkers, but he's extremely talented, and he did what he had to do early in his life with what he was doing on YouTube and everything else to earn where he got. Whether or not that's a happy place, I can't say, but he earned it because he put in what it takes to do that. What is it? Extreme talent, uh, exposure, and timing. All of these things contribute. So I don't I don't buy the whole, the whole question that, say, somebody earned it and somebody didn't. If somebody is a gigantic internet sensation and they're comparing it to somebody who worked the ranks up in some radio station over 20 years when it came in as a as a, a male boy and ended up as the the anchor of the news at night and they're trying to tell me 
that there's some kind of inherent difference between one person's hard work and the other person's. I think they're they're stuck in an old way of thinking, and I actually think they're wrong. So I'm, I'm a little surprised that question even came up in that conference because it's, to me, a little bit laughable. Everybody's earning whatever they're earning. And, you know, to compare one to another is a little bit, is a little bit weird to me. I, I actually know where exactly where the question came up from. It was because of everyone who was in on that panel, who all <laughs> had mainstream media jobs, I think my outlet had by and far more, like twice to three times as many viewers as any of their their uh, their broadcast stations. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's part of it is a little bit of, a little bit of jealousy, and I think some of it is also, and this could happen to anybody. Which is if if I if I in my mind have worked for something and I followed a very specific way to get to that success, and someone by, bypasses all of that, I I feel a little slighted. It's not right. It's not logical for me to feel slighted, but I, I probably will feel slighted. Well, you're going to, because you're going to feel that way because you had to do it differently and the way right. you had to do it was maybe harder and more restrictive. Uh, you know, you hear this all the time now. It's actually very interesting you brought this up, but it's a very current topic among comic creators, comic strip creators, comic book creators, that they had to go through the system, that they had to work their butts off and take a billion rejection letters before they could even get through to a syndication to be interested in their comic strip. And here comes Web Comic Man, and within a year, he's making more money on his webcomic than this guy who had to do the, the, the hard life for, for 20 years to get his comic through. Yeah, it's absolutely true that when that stuff gets bypassed, there's new ways of looking at it. But that's not any different than somebody saying, well, I don't think it's fair this Amazon should come along and sell a bunch of stuff online and become so dominant so quick when... We here at Kmart have struggled for decades to become an important uh, retail voice for our customers and earn their trust or whatever, and we're about to go bankrupt. And meanwhile, Amazon, Johnny Come Lately, came in here and swooped, swooped it all away. Well, that is just the nature of progression and change, and I don't know how you get around that. There's going to come a day, dude, where you and I and everybody else who are making content on the Internet are going to be semi-usurped by something new and better and bigger and cooler. You know, you could even say right now that, uh, you know, Vine came along, that app Vine came along and created mega, genuine mega superstars. There were people in there with 11.8 million followers who came out of nowhere, who in less than a year are making more than I'll ever make. And all they're doing is showing up at events and making girls scream. You could get all cr grungy and cr complainy about that and, it, you know, start talking like an old man. But in the end, what's the difference? It's always like this. It's always been like this. People didn't have electricity when I was your age. And then the people who had electricity, or I, but people didn't have indoor plumbing when I was your age. It's never, that's never going to end. And, and if the snow, if you had to walk uphill both ways in the snow, which is basically what we're describing here, I don't know what to tell you. Then you had a great life experience. Our snow is a little bit different, but it's still snow and we still get to walk in it. Scott, I know you have a hard out here, but I, I do want to give you some time to talk about Nerdtacular, because of all the things that you have between your podcast network and your art, your, your, your comic store, all the success that you've had, I think it kind of culminates into this wonderful geek-gasm in Utah. Can you, can you tell me what exactly is Nerdtacular? All right, so this is our ninth year. Um, it's been around since 07. It started out as a small gathering of about 189 to 100, I think is what we had, uh, locals is all it was here in Salt Lake City. We all met at a movie theater that I rented out. It was just like, like a way for us to go all see a nerdy movie and hang out. And what brought us together was we're all in the same community. People are listening to my shows, reading my comics, and here we all are, friends, everyone's friends. And it was kind of a one-off. We didn't think much about it. But very quickly after that, uh, we started to notice a lot more interest. The next year, we doubled in size. The year after that, we doubled again. Uh, the first year, we had uh, two people from out of the uh, out of state the next year, we had 40 people from out of state. The year after that, we had 115 people out of state, uh, plus another, you know, three or 400 from in the state. And we, we maxed out the space. We were still doing movies, just had the biggest theater we could get. And we noticed that a bunch of these people were like from France and England and Australia and Canada and like all these places. And I kept, I started thinking, this is, this is kind of bonkers. We should, maybe, maybe we should make this bigger or do something to just more, make it more solid. So in 2011, we started making it a convention, uh, which meant panels and talks and a band and, you know, just kind of made it a bigger, broader thing. Did a full day. That went really well. Did the same thing the next year. Totally maxed out on space. We're like, what are we going to do now? So the short of it is, 
from 2013 and then last year, so two years in a row, we've done it at this, uh, normally in the winter, it's a big ski resort, but in the summer, it's a, like a summer resort with all kinds of summer stuff. But it's up in the canyon, about uh, eight, eight to 10, maybe 12 minutes outside of Salt Lake City. Beautiful up there, up there in the trees. We do it in the summer, so it's awesome temperatures up in the mountain. Uh, big hotel, very fancy, very nice, lots of restaurants, all that kind of stuff. And we just blow it out and have a big ballroom. We have multiple tracks. We split up every day and do uh, two days full of podcasting tracks. And Tom Merritt and Veronica Belmont might do one on Sword and Laser or how to podcast or something. And we have one on Kickstarters. We had a comics panel last year. Uh, we have various uh, luminaries from around the comics industry and video game industry come and, and visit. Some just as guests, they just show up. And you know, the guy that writes all the music at Blizzard Entertainment just comes because he loves it. Uh, that kind of, it's that kind of experience. And we also cap the tickets there. We always sell around 700 tickets. That's about as much as we want to have. We've decided that any more than seven or 800 people is kind of too much. And it takes it away from the specialness of it being kind of an intimate kind of gathering. And we're all there for the same thing. So to answer your question, it's like, yes, all these other things led to it. But in a lot of ways, Nerdtacular leads to those other things, the community, the shows, the comics, they feed off of it in a very real way. And it's kind of our way. I mean, can we make it bigger? Can we go crazy and try to make it a big money bag thing? We could. I'm not all that interested in doing that because it tends to pay off throughout the rest of the year more than I think it would as a single event. Um, it really brings us together, reminds us all why we're in this. Uh, it's a safe place. It's a happy place. Everybody's welcome. And uh, we just create a really fun event for a few days. And some people get really drunk and some people don't drink at all. And some people... <laughs> stay up too late. Some people sit around listening to Justin Robert Young tell jokes all night and some people go to sleep and <laughs> the next day, some people split up and see whatever kind of panel they want. We always have a great band. It's just an awesome, awesome time. And uh, we're doing it again this year. It's happening at the end of July. Uh, tickets on sale soon at nerdtacular.com. I think the 25th is when we're doing it. So if you have any interest in what I do, and this really is for a community and those who are curious about our community, it sounds like we're being weird, but we're not. Uh, if you're interested in that, where it's like, imagine Comic-Con, but intentionally much smaller so that we can all actually meet and shake hands and hang out and talk shop and, you know, really communicate about what makes creating stuff on, online cool. And and uh, and that's what it's all about. So people should keep an eye on that if they have any interest in that at all. Is at nerdtacular.com is where they want to go. Scott Johnson, I want to thank you so very much for being on Padre's Corner. It's We're going to have you back. I mean, when we get more time, we're going to just sit down and shoot the breeze about whatever. But yeah. for now, if people want to find out more about you, where do they go? Of course, they're going to go to nerdtacular.com. Of course, they're going to stop by Frog Pants. But where else can they find you on the Internet, you and your work? Well, if they want to see my comic, it's at myextralife.com. Uh, nothing to do with the charity, the awesome charity, I should say. I love that charity, but it's the name is just an unfortunate uh, connection that happened years ago that uh, sometimes people get confused. But it's called myextralife.com. It's been around since 2001. Very proud of it. I, I update it every week. People, uh, if they like web comics, they might enjoy that. Uh, but yeah, frogpants.com is a great place. And really, I do a lot of stuff on Twitter. I have about 50,000 tweets and people always say, man, you tweet a lot. And the truth is I do, but most of those, I'll bet you 90%, if I could figure out a way to break it out, there's probably a utility somewhere. Maybe the chat room can find it, but uh, easily 90% of my tweets are replies to people. So that, as far as I'm concerned, Twitter's a place to talk to you. And if you're interested in doing that, follow me on Twitter at Scott Johnson. And thanks for having me on, man. It's been a total blast. Uh, I've, I've been wanting to have you back for a while. Our schedules have just never quite meshed because of course you're a father and you have things to take care of but i promise we'll get you back on the show and let's just geek out all right man thanks all right scott johnson frog pants network stop by at nerdtacular.com you're probably going to want to visit them this coming july and remember if you need something geeky this here is the man you want to talk to <laughs> thanks man we'll see you now, folks, that's the end of this episode of Padres Corner. I want to thank you for stopping by and for just hanging with us. This is what we do each week. We're going to sit. We're going to talk to the people that we want to talk to. We're going to talk about the topics we want to talk about. It doesn't necessarily have to be tech. It doesn't necessarily have to be science. It just has to be things that people of tech and of science are interested in. Now, don't forget that you could always drop by our show page at twit.tv slash Padre 
There you'll find all of our back episodes along with our show notes. So, for example, if there was a, a story that you particularly liked, you could find links to it in those show notes. And you'll also find these really helpful drop-down menus so you can get every episode of Padres Corner automatically downloaded into the device of your choice. Of course, you can always follow me on Twitter. If you go to twitter.com slash PadresJ, you'll find my account. And if you follow me, you'll be able to see what I'm going to be doing on every episode of every show I do on the Twit TV network. I'm pretty good about making sure I post before the shows. Now, you can also suggest guests for future episodes of Padres Corner. In fact, many of the guests come from your suggestions. So go there, twitter.com slash PadresJ. That's at PadresJ. Give me a follow and uh, let's start chatting about the future. I want to thank everyone here who makes this show possible, to Lisa and to Leo for letting me keep the lights on, all the engineers for keeping all the gear working, of course to Scott Johnson for dropping by, and uh, to you, because without you, we don't have a show. I'm Father Robert Palliser, the digital Jesuit, and you've made it to the other side. Okay.